Kublai Khan. Kublai, also known by his temple name as the Emperor Shizu of Yuan and his regnal name Setsun Khan, was the founder of the Yuan dynasty of China and the fifth Khagan emperor of the Mongol Empire from 1260 to 1294, although after the division of the empire this was a nominal position. He proclaimed the empire's dynastic name, Great Yuan, in 1271, and ruled Yuan China until his death in 1294. Kublai was the second son of Tului by his chief wife Sorgatani Beki, and a grandson of Genghis Khan. He was almost 12 when Genghis Khan died in 1227. He had succeeded his older brother Monkey as Khagan in 1260, but had to defeat his younger brother Arik Bok in the Tuluid civil war lasting until 1264. This episode marked the beginning of the fragmentation of the empire. Kublai's real power was limited to the Yuan Empire, even though as Khagan he still had influence in the Ilkhanate and, to a significantly lesser degree, in the Golden Horde. If one considers the Mongol Empire at that time as a whole, his realm reached from the Pacific Ocean to the Black Sea, from Siberia to what is now Afghanistan. In 1271, Kublai established the Yuan dynasty and formally claimed orthodox succession from prior Chinese dynasties. The Yuan dynasty came to rule over most of present-day China, Mongolia, Korea, southern Siberia, and other adjacent areas. He also amassed influence in the Middle East and Europe as Khagan. By 1279, the Yuan conquest of the Song dynasty was completed and Kublai became the first non-Han emperor to rule all of China proper. The imperial portrait of Kublai was part of an album of the portraits of Yuan emperors and empresses, now in the collection of the National Palace Museum in Taipei. White, the color of the imperial costume of Kublai, was the imperial color of the Yuan dynasty based on the Chinese philosophical concept of the five elements. Early years. Kublai Khan was the fourth son of Tului, and his second son with Sorgatani Beki. As his grandfather Genghis Khan advised, Sorgatani chose a Buddhist Tangut woman as her son's nurse, whom Kublai later honored highly. On his way home after the Mongol conquest of Khwarezmia, Genghis Khan performed a ceremony on his grandson's monkey in Kublai after their first hunt in 1224 near the Ili River. Kublai was nine years old and with his eldest brother killed a rabbit and an antelope. After his grandfather smeared fat from the killed animals onto Kublai's middle finger in accordance with a Mongol tradition, he said, The words of this boy Kublai are full of wisdom, heed them well, heed them all of you. The elderly Genghis Khan would die three years after this event in 1227, when Kublai was 12. Kublai's father Tului would serve as regent for two years until Genghis' successor, Kublai's third uncle Ogade, was enthroned as Khagan in 1229. After the Mongol conquest of the Jin dynasty, in 1236, Ogade gave Hebei, attached with 80,000 households, to the family of Tului, who died in 1232. Kublai received an estate of his own, which included 10,000 households. Because he was inexperienced, Kublai allowed local officials free reign. Corruption amongst his officials and aggressive taxation caused large numbers of ethnic Han peasants to flee, which led to a decline in tax revenues. Kublai quickly came to his appanage in Hebei and ordered reforms. Sorgatani Beki sent new officials to help him and tax laws were revised. Thanks to those efforts, many of the people who fled returned. The most prominent, and arguably most influential, component of Kublai Khan's early life was his study and a strong attraction to contemporary Han culture. Kublai invited Heian, the leading Buddhist monk in northern China, to his ordo in Mongolia. When he met Heian in Karakoram in 1242, Kublai asked him about the philosophy of Buddhism. Heian named Kublai's son, who was born in 1243, Zhenjin, Chinese, True Gold. Heian also introduced Kublai to the formerly Taoist, Taoist, and at the time Buddhist monk, Liu Bingzong. Liu was a painter, calligrapher, poet, and mathematician, and he became Kublai's advisor when Heian returned to his temple in modern Beijing. Kublai soon added the Shaanxi scholar Zhao Bai to his entourage. Kublai employed people of other nationalities as well, for he was keen to balance local and imperial interests, Mongol and Turkic. Victory in Northern China In 1251, Kublai's eldest brother Monki became Khan of the Mongol Empire, and Khwarezmian Mahmud Yalavak and Kublai were sent to China. Kublai received the viceroyalty over Northern China and moved his ordo to central Inner Mongolia. During his years as viceroy, Kublai managed his territory well, 
boosted the agricultural output of Henan, and increased social welfare spendings after receiving Xi'an. These acts received great acclaim from ethnic Han warlords and were essential to the founding of the Yuan dynasty. In 1252, Kublai criticized Mahmud Yalavak, who was never highly valued by his ethnic Han associates, over his cavalier execution of suspects during a judicial review, and Zhao Bai attacked him for his presumptuous attitude toward the throne. Monkey dismissed Mahmud Yalavak, which met with resistance from Han Confucian trained officials. In 1253, Kublai was ordered to attack Yunnan and he tried to ask the Dali Kingdom to submit. The ruling Gao family resisted and killed Mongol envoys. The Mongols divided their forces into three. One wing rode eastward into the Sichuan Basin. The second column under Subutai's son or Yangkadai took a difficult route into the mountains of western Sichuan. Kublai went south over the grasslands and met up with the first column. While Uryangkadai traveled along the lakeside from the north, Kublai took the capital city of Dali and spared the residents despite the slaying of his ambassadors. The Dali emperor Duan Xingzi himself defected to the Mongols, who used his troops to conquer the rest of Yunnan. Duan Xingzi, the last king of Dali, was appointed by Monkey Khan as the first Tusi or local ruler. Duan accepted the stationing of a pacification commissioner there. After Kublai's departure, unrest broke out among certain factions. In 1255 and 1256, Duan Xingzi was presented at court, where he offered Monkey Khan maps of Yunnan and counsels about the vanquishing of the tribes who had not yet surrendered. Duan then led a considerable army to serve as guides and vanguards for the Mongol army. By the end of 1256, Uryangkadai had completely pacified Yunnan. Kublai was attracted by the abilities of Tibetan monks as healers. In 1253 he made Drogon Chogyal Thagpa of the Sakya school, a member of his entourage. Thagpa bestowed on Kublai and his wife, Chabi, Chabui, an empowerment, initiation ritual. Kublai appointed Lien Shishen of the Kingdom of Kocho, 1231-1280, the head of his pacification commission in 1254. Some officials, who were jealous of Kublai's success, said that he was getting above himself and dreaming of having his own empire by competing with Monk's capital Karakoram. Monkey Khan sent two tax inspectors, Alamdar and Liu Taiping, to audit Kublai's officials in 1257. They found fault, listed 142 breaches of regulations, accused Han officials and executed some of them, and Kublai's new pacification commission was abolished. Kublai sent a two-man embassy with his wives and then appealed in person to Monkey, who publicly forgave his younger brother and reconciled with him. The Taoists had obtained their wealth and status by seizing Buddhist temples. Monkey repeatedly demanded that the Taoists cease their denigration of Buddhism and ordered Kublai to end the clerical strife between the Taoists and Buddhists in his territory. Kublai called a conference of Taoist and Buddhist leaders in early 1258. At the conference, the Taoist claim was officially refuted, and Kublai forcibly converted 237 Taoist temples to Buddhism and destroyed all copies of the Taoist texts. Kublai Khan and the Yuan dynasty clearly favored Buddhism, while his counterparts in the Chagatai Khanate, the Golden Horde, and the Ilkhanate later converted to Islam at various times in history, Burke of the Golden Horde being the only Muslim during Kublai's era, his successor did not convert to Islam. In 1258, Monkey put Kublai in command of the Eastern Army and summoned him to assist with an attack on Sichuan. As he was suffering from gout, Kublai was allowed to stay home, but he moved to assist Monkey anyway. Before Kublai arrived in 1259, word reached him that Monkey had died. Kublai decided to keep the death of his brother secret and continued the attack on Wuhan, near the Yangtze. While Kublai's force besieged Wuchang, Uryangkadai joined him. The Song minister Jia Sidao secretly approached Kublai to propose terms. He offered an annual tribute of 200,000 tails of silver and 200,000 bolts of silk, in exchange for Mongol agreement to the Yangtze as the frontier between the states. Kublai declined at first but later reached a peace agreement with Jia Sidao. Enthronement and Civil War Kublai received a message from his wife that his younger brother Arik Bok had been raising troops, so he returned north to the Mongolian plateau. Before he arrived, he learned that Arik Bok had held a Kuraltai, Mongol Great Council, at the capital Karakoram, which had named him Great Khan with the support of most of Genghis Khan's descendants. Kublai and the fourth brother, the Il Khan Hulagu, opposed this. 
Kublai's ethnic Han staff encouraged Kublai to ascend the throne, and almost all the senior princes in northern China and Manchuria supported his candidacy. Upon returning to his own territories, Kublai summoned his own Kuraltai. Fewer members of the royal family supported Kublai's claims to the title, though the small number of attendees included representatives of all the Borjigan lines except that of Hochi. This Kuraltai proclaimed Kublai Great Khan, on April 15, 1260, despite Arak Bok's apparently legal claim to become Khan. This led to warfare between Kublai and Arak Bok, which resulted in the destruction of the Mongol capital at Karakoram. In Shaanxi and Sichuan, Monk's army supported Arak Bok. Kublai dispatched Lian Shishen to Shaanxi and Sichuan, where they executed Arak Bok's civil administrator Lu Taiping and won over several wavering generals. To secure the southern front, Kublai attempted a diplomatic resolution and sent envoys to Hangzhou, but Jia broke his promise and arrested them. Kublai sent Abishka as new Khan to the Chagatai Khanate. Arik Bok captured Abishka, two other princes, and 100 men, and he had his own man, Algu, crowned Khan of Chagatai's territory. In the first armed clash between Arik Bok and Kublai, Arik Bok lost and his commander Alamdar was killed at the battle. In revenge, Arik Bok had Abishka executed. Kublai cut off supplies of food to Karakoram with the support of his cousin Kaden, son of Ogade Khan. Karakoram quickly fell to Kublai's large army, but following Kublai's departure it was temporarily retaken by Arik Bok in 1261. Yizhou governor Li Tan revolted against Mongol rule in February 1262, and Kublai ordered his chancellor Shi Tianza and Shi Shu to attack Li Tan. The two armies crushed Li Tan's revolt in just a few months and Li Tan was executed. These armies also executed Wang Wentong, Li Tan's father-in-law, who had been appointed the chief administrator of the central secretariat, Zhang Shu Sheng, early in Kublai's reign and became one of Kublai's most trusted Han Chinese officials. The incident instilled in Kublai a distrust of ethnic Hans. After becoming emperor, Kublai banned granting the titles of and tithes to ethnic Han warlords. Cha Taid Khan Algu, who had been appointed by Arik Bok, declared his allegiance to Kublai and defeated a punitive expedition sent by Arik Bok in 1262. The Ilkhan Hulagu also sided with Kublai and criticized Arik Bok. Arik Bok surrendered to Kublai at Xanadu on August 21, 1264. The rulers of the Western Khanates acknowledged Kublai's victory and rule in Mongolia. When Kublai summoned them to a new Kuraltai, Algu Khan demanded recognition of his illegal position from Kublai in return. Despite tensions between them, both Hulagu and Burke, Khan of the Golden Horde, at first accepted Kublai's invitation. However, they soon declined to attend the Kuraltai. Kublai pardoned Arik Bok, although he executed Arik Bok's chief supporters. Emperor of the Yuan Dynasty Kublai Khan considered China his main base, realizing within a decade of his enthronement as Great Khan that he needed to concentrate on governing there. From the beginning of his reign, he adopted Chinese political and cultural models and worked to minimize the influences of regional lords, who had held immense power before and during the Song dynasty. Kublai heavily relied on his Chinese advisors until about 1276. He had many Han Chinese advisors, such as Lu Bingzang and Xu Heng, and employed many Buddhist Uyghurs, some of whom were resident commissioners running Chinese districts. Kublai also appointed the Sakya Lama Drogon Chogyal Phagpa his imperial preceptor, giving him power over all the empire's Buddhist monks. In 1270, after the Phagspa Lama created the Phagspa script, he was promoted to imperial preceptor. Kublai established the Supreme Control Commission under the Phagspa Lama to administer affairs of Tibetan and Chinese monks. During Phagspa's absence in Tibet, the Tibetan monk Sangha rose to high office and had the office renamed the Commission for Buddhist and Tibetan Affairs. In 1286, Sangha became the dynasty's chief fiscal officer. However, their corruption later embittered Kublai, and he later relied wholly on younger Mongol aristocrats. Antong of the Jalairs and Bayan of the Baran served as grand councillors from 1265, and Oz Timur of the Arulad headed the censorate. Borakula's descendant, Ochichur, headed a Keshig, Mongolian Imperial Guard, and the Palace Provision Commission. In the eighth year of Ziyuan, 1271, Kublai officially created the Yuan Dynasty and proclaimed the capital as Dadu, Grand Capital, known as Kanbalik or Daidu to the Mongols, 
at modern-day Beijing, the following year. His summer capital was in Chengdu. To unify China, Kublai began a massive offensive against the remnants of the Southern Song in 1274 and finally destroyed the Song in 1279. Unifying the country at last at the Battle of Yamen where the last Song Emperor Zhao Bing committed suicide by jumping into the sea and ending the Song dynasty. Most of the Yuan domains were administered as provinces, also translated as the branch secretariat, each with a governor and vice-governor. This included China proper, Manchuria, Mongolia, and a special Zhendong branch secretariat that extended into the Korean peninsula. The central region was separate from the rest, consisting of much of present-day North China. It was considered the most important region of the dynasty and was directly governed by the Jiangsu Sheng at Dadu. Tibet was governed by another top-level administrative department called the Bureau of Buddhist and Tibetan Affairs. Kublai promoted economic growth by rebuilding the Grand Canal, repairing public buildings, and extending highways. However, his domestic policy included some aspects of the old Mongol living traditions, and as his reign continued, these traditions would clash increasingly frequently with traditional Chinese economic and social culture. Kublai decreed that partner merchants of the Mongols should be subject to taxes in 1262 and set up the Office of Market Taxes to supervise them in 1268. After the Mongol conquest of the Song, the Muslim, Uyghur and Chinese merchants expanded their operations to the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. In 1286, maritime trade was put under the Office of Market Taxes. The main source of revenue of the government was the monopoly of salt production. The Mongol administration had issued paper currencies from 1227 on. In August 1260, Kublai created the first unified paper currency called Zhao Chao. Bills were circulated throughout the Yuan domain with no expiration date. To guard against devaluation, the currency was convertible with silver and gold, and the government accepted tax payments in paper currency. In 1273, Kublai issued a new series of state-sponsored bills to finance his conquest of the Song, although eventually a lack of fiscal discipline and inflation turned this move into an economic disaster. It was required to pay only in the form of paper money. To ensure its use, Kublai's government confiscated gold and silver from private citizens and foreign merchants, but traders received government-issued notes in exchange. Kublai Khan is considered to be the first fiat moneymaker. The paper bills made collecting taxes and administering the empire much easier and reduced the cost of transporting coins. In 1287, Kublai's minister Sangha created a new currency, Zun Chao, to deal with a budget shortfall. It was non-convertible and denominated in copper cash. Later, Gekatu of the Ilkhanate attempted to adopt the system in Iran and the Middle East, which was a complete failure, and shortly afterwards he was assassinated. Sangha was a Tibetan. A rich merchant from the Madurai Sultanate, Abu Ali, was associated closely with its royal family. After falling out with them, he moved to Yuan China and received a Korean woman as his wife and a job from the Mongol Emperor. The woman was formerly Sangha's wife and her father held the title of Chesang Yun during the reign of Chengyel of Goryeo, according to the Donggak Tunggong, Goryosa and Lu Munyan's Zhang Enji. Kublai encouraged Asian arts and demonstrated religious tolerance. Despite his anti-Daoist edicts, Kublai respected the Daoist master and appointed Zhang Lushan as the patriarch of the Daoist Xuanzhou. Under Zhang's advice, Daoist temples were put under the Academy of Scholarly Worthies. Several Europeans visited the empire, notably Marco Polo in the 1270s, who may have seen the summer capital Shangdu. During the Southern Song, the descendant of Confucius at Chufu, Duke Yansheng Kong Duanyu fled south with the Song Emperor to Kuzhou. While the newly established Jin Dynasty, 1115-1234, in the north appointed Kong Duanyu's brother Kong Duankao who remained in Chufu as Duke Yansheng. From that time up until the Yuan Dynasty, there were two Duke Yanshengs, once in the north in Chufu and the other in the south at Kuzhou. An invitation to come back to Chufu was extended to the southern Duke Yansheng Kongzu by the Yuan Dynasty Emperor Kublai Khan. The title was taken away from the southern branch after Kongzu rejected the invitation, so the northern branch of the family kept the title of Duke Yansheng. Yuan emperors like Kublai Khan forbade practices such as butchering according to Jewish, Kashrut, or Muslim, Dabiha, legal codes and other restrictive decrees continued. Circumcision was also strictly forbidden. Scientific Developments and Relations with Minorities 
Thirty Muslims served as high officials in the court of Kublai Khan. Eight of the dynasty's twelve administrative districts had Muslim governors appointed by Kublai Khan. Among the Muslim governors was Sayyid Ajil Shams al-Din Omar, who became administrator of Yunnan. He was a well-learned man in the Confucian and Taoist traditions and is believed to have propagated Islam in China. Kublai Khan patronized Muslim scholars and scientists, and Muslim astronomers contributed to the construction of the observatory in Shaanxi. Astronomers such as Jamal ad-Din introduced seven new instruments and concepts that allowed the correction of the Chinese calendar. Muslim cartographers made accurate maps of all the nations along the Silk Road and greatly influenced the knowledge of Yuan dynasty rulers and merchants. Muslim physicians organized hospitals and had their own institutes of medicine in Beijing and Chengdu. In Beijing was the renowned Guangwei Si, Department of Extensive Mercy, where Wei medicine and surgery were taught. Muslim mathematicians introduced Euclidean geometry, spherical trigonometry and Arabic numerals in China. Kublai brought siege engineers Ismail and Al al-Din to China, and together they invented the Muslim trebuchet, which was utilized by Kublai Khan during the Battle of Xiangyang. Warfare and Foreign Relations Although Kublai restricted the functions of the Keshek, he created a new imperial bodyguard, at first entirely ethnic Han in composition but later strengthened with Kipchak, Alan, Asud, and Russian units. Once his own Keshig was organized in 1263, Kublai put three of the original Keshigs under the charge of the descendants of Genghis Khan's assistants, Borakula, Borshu, and Mukali. Mongol and Han units were organized using the same decimal organization that Genghis Khan used. The Mongols eagerly adopted new artillery and technologies. Kublai and his generals adopted an elaborate, moderate style of military campaigns in southern China. Effective assimilation of the naval techniques of the Han people allowed the Yuan army to quickly conquer the Song, Tibet and Xinjiang. In 1285 the Dricking Kagyu sect revolted, attacking Sakya monasteries. The Chataid Khan, Dua, helped the rebels, laying siege to Gaochang and defeating Kublai's garrisons in the Tarim Basin. Kaidu destroyed an army at Beshbalik and occupied the city the following year. Many Uyghurs abandoned Kashgar for safer bases back in the eastern part of the Yuan dynasty. After Kublai's grandson Bukha Timur crushed the resistance of the Dricking Kagyu, killing 10,000 Tibetans in 1291, Tibet was fully pacified. Annexation of Goryeo Kublai Khan invaded Goryeo on the Korean peninsula and made it a tributary vassal state in 1260. After another Mongol intervention in 1273, Goryeo came under even tighter control of the Yuan. Goryeo became a Mongol military base, and several Miriarchy commands were established there. Further naval expansion. Despite the opposition of some of his Confucian-trained advisors, Kublai decided to invade Japan, Burma, Vietnam, and Java, following the suggestions of some of his Mongol officials. He also attempted to subjugate peripheral lands such as Sakhalin, where its indigenous people eventually submitted to the Mongols by 1308, after Kublai's death. These costly invasions and conquests and the introduction of paper currency caused inflation. From 1273 to 1276, war against the Southern Song Dynasty and Japan made the issue of paper currency expand from 110,000 ding to 1,420,000 ding. Invasions of Japan Within Kublai's court his most trusted governors and advisors appointed by meritocracy with the essence of multiculturalism were Mongol, Simu, Korean, Wei and Han peoples. Because the Woku extended support to the crumbling Southern Song dynasty, Kublai Khan initiated invasions of Japan. Kublai Khan twice attempted to invade Japan. It is believed that both attempts were partly thwarted by bad weather or a flaw in the design of ships that were based on riverboats without keels, and his fleets were destroyed. The first attempt took place in 1274, with a fleet of 900 ships. The second invasion occurred in 1281 when Mongols sent two separate forces. 900 ships containing 40,000 Korean, Han, and Mongol troops were sent from Masan while a force of 100,000 sailed from southern China in 3,500 ships, each close to 240 feet 73 meters, long. The fleet was hastily assembled and ill-equipped to cope with maritime conditions. In November, they sailed into the treacherous waters that separate Korea and Japan by 180 kilometers, 110 miles. 
The Mongols easily took over Tsushima Island about halfway across the strait and then Iki Island closer to Kyushu. The Korean fleet reached Hakata Bay on June 23, 1281, and landed its troops and animals, but the ships from China were nowhere to be seen. Mongol landing forces were subsequently defeated at the Battle of Akasaka and the Battle of Torikai Gata. Takezaki Suenaga's samurai attacked the Mongol army and fought them, as reinforcements led by Shiraishi Mihiyasu arrived and defeated the Mongols, who suffered around 3,500 dead. The samurai warriors, following their custom, rode out against the Mongol forces for individual combat but the Mongols held their formation. The Mongols fought as a united force, not as individuals, and bombarded the samurai with exploding missiles and showered them with arrows. Eventually, the remaining Japanese withdrew from the coastal zone inland to a fortress. The Mongol forces did not chase the fleeing Japanese into an area about which they lacked reliable intelligence. In a number of individual skirmishes, known collectively as the Koan Campaign or the Second Battle of Hakata Bay, the Mongol forces were driven back to their ships by the samurai. The Japanese army was heavily outnumbered, but had fortified the coastal line with two-meter-high walls, and was easily able to repulse the Mongolian forces that were launched against it. Maritime archaeologist Kenzo Hayashida led the investigation that discovered the wreckage of the second invasion fleet off the western coast of Takashima district, Shiga. His team's findings strongly indicate that Kublai rushed to invade Japan and attempted to construct his enormous fleet in one year, a task that should have taken up to five years. This forced the Chinese to use any available ships, including riverboats. Most importantly, the Chinese, under Kublai's control, built many ships quickly in order to contribute to the fleets in both of the invasions. In October 2011, a wreck, possibly one of Kublai's invasion craft, was found off the coast of Nagasaki. Invasions of Vietnam Kublai Khan invaded Dai Viet Annam, now Vietnam in a total of five separate incursions between 1257 to 1292, with major campaigns in 1258, 1285, and 1287. These three campaigns are treated by a number of scholars as a success due to the establishment of tributary relations with Dai Viet despite the Mongols suffering major military defeats. In contrast, Vietnamese historiography regards the war as a major victory against the foreign invaders whom they called the Mongol Yokes. The first invasion began in 1258 under the United Mongol Empire, as it looked for alternative paths to invade the Song dynasty. The Mongol general Yuriyangkadai was successful in capturing the Vietnamese capital Thang Long, before turning north in 1259 to invade the Song dynasty in modern-day Guangxi. As part of a coordinated Mongol attack with armies attacking in Sichuan under Monkey Khan and other Mongol armies attacking in modern-day Shandong and Henan. The first invasion also established tributary relations between the Vietnamese dynasty, formerly a Song dynasty tributary state, and the Yuan dynasty. Intending to demand greater tribute and direct Yuan oversight of local affairs in Dai Viet and Champa, the Yuan launched another invasion in 1285. The second invasion of Dai Viet failed to accomplish its goals, and the Yuan launched a third invasion in 1287 with the intent of replacing the incooperative Dai Viet ruler Tran Nyan Tong with the defected Tran Prince Tran Ik Tak. By the end of the second and third invasions, which involved both initial successes and eventual major defeats for the Mongols, both Dai Viet and Champa decided to accept the nominal supremacy of the Yuan dynasty and became tributary states to avoid further conflict. Southeast Asia and South Seas Three expeditions against Burma, in 1277, 1283, and 1287, brought the Mongol forces to the Irrawaddy Delta, whereupon they captured Bagan, the capital of the Pagan Kingdom and established their government. Kublai had to be content with establishing a formal suzerainty, but Pagan finally became a tributary state, sending tributes to the Yuan court until the Yuan dynasty fell to the Ming dynasty in 1368. Mongol interests in these areas were commercial and tributary relationships. Kublai Khan maintained close relations with Siam, in particular with Prince Mangrai of Chiang Mai and King Ram Kamong of Sukhothai. In fact, Kublai encouraged them to attack the Khmers after the Thais were being pushed southwards from Nanchao. This happened after King Jayawarman VIII of the Khmer Empire refused to pay tribute to the Mongols. Jayawarman VIII was so insistent on not having to pay tribute to Kublai that he had Mongol envoys imprisoned. These attacks from the Siamese eventually weakened the Khmer Empire. 
The Mongols then decided to venture south into Cambodia in 1283 by land from Champa. They were able to conquer Cambodia by 1284. Cambodia effectively became a vassal state by 1285 when Jayawarman VIII was finally forced to pay tribute to Kublai. During the last years of his reign, Kublai launched a naval punitive expedition of 20-30,000 men against Singazari on Java, 1293, but the invading Mongol forces were forced to withdraw by Majapahit after considerable losses of more than 3,000 troops. Nevertheless, by 1294, the year that Kublai died, the Thai kingdoms of Sukhothai and Chiang Mai had become vassal states of the Yuan dynasty. Europe Under Kublai, direct contact between East Asia and Europe was established, made possible by Mongol control of the Central Asian trade routes and facilitated by the presence of efficient postal services. In the beginning of the 13th century, Europeans and Central Asians, merchants, travelers, and missionaries of different orders, made their way to China. The presence of Mongol power allowed large numbers of Yuan subjects, intent on warfare or trade, to travel to other parts of the Mongol Empire, all the way to Rus, Persia, and Mesopotamia. Africa In the 13th century, the Sultanate of Mogadishu, through its trade with prior Chinese regimes, had acquired enough of a reputation in Asia to attract the attention of Kublai Khan. According to Marco Polo, Kublai sent an envoy to Mogadishu to spy out the Sultanate but the delegation was captured and imprisoned. Kublai Khan then sent another envoy to treat for the release of the earlier Mongol delegation sent to Africa. Capital City After Kublai Khan was proclaimed Khagan at his residence in Shangdu on May 5, 1260, he began to organize the country. Zhang Wenqin, a central government official, was sent by Kublai in 1260 to Daiming where unrest had been reported in the local population. A friend of Zhang's, Guo Shoujing, accompanied him on this mission. Guo was interested in engineering, was an expert astronomer and skilled instrument maker, and he understood that good astronomical observations depended on expertly made instruments. Guo began to construct astronomical instruments, including water clocks for accurate timing and armillary spheres that represented the celestial globe. Turkestani architect Iktiar al-Din, also known as Igdir, designed the buildings of the city of the Khagan, Khanbalik, Dadu. Kublai also employed foreign artists to build his new capital. One of them, a Nuar named Araniko, built the white stupa that was the largest structure in Khanbalik, Dadu. Zhang advised Kublai that Guo was a leading expert in hydraulic engineering. Kublai knew the importance of water management for irrigation, transport of grain, and flood control, and he asked Guo to look at these aspects in the area between Dadu, now Beijing, and the Yellow River. To provide Dadu with a new supply of water, Guo found the Baifu Spring in Mount Shen and had a 30 kilometers 19 miles channel built to move water to Dadu. He proposed connecting the water supply across different river basins, built new canals with sluices to control the water level, and achieved great success with the improvements he made. This pleased Kublai and Guo was asked to undertake similar projects in other parts of the country. In 1264 he was asked to go to Gansu to repair the damage that had been caused to the irrigation systems by the years of war during the Mongol advance through the region. Guo traveled extensively along with his friend Zhang taking notes of the work needed to be done to unblock damaged parts of the system and to make improvements to its efficiency. He sent his report directly to Kublai Khan. Nayan's Rebellion During the conquest of the Jin, Genghis Khan's younger brothers received large appanages in Manchuria. Their descendants strongly supported Kublai's coronation in 1260, but the younger generation desired more independence. Kublai enforced Ogade Khan's regulations that the Mongol noblemen could appoint overseers and the great Khan's special officials, in their appanages, but otherwise respected appanage rights. Kublai's son Mangala established direct control over Chang'an and Shaanxi in 1272. In 1274, Kublai appointed Lian Shishen to investigate abuses of power by Mongol appanage holders in Manchuria. The region called Lia Tung was immediately brought under the Khagan's control, in 1284, eliminating autonomy of the Mongol nobles there. Threatened by the advance of Kublai's bureaucratization, Nayan, a fourth-generation descendant of one of Genghis Khan's brothers, either Temuj or Belgate, instigated a revolt in 1287. Nayan tried to join forces with Kublai's competitor Kaidu in Central Asia. Manchuria's native Jurchens and water Tatars, who had suffered a famine, supported Nayan. 
The rebellion was crippled by early detection and timid leadership. Kublai sent Bayan to keep Nayan and Kaidu apart by occupying Karakoram, while Kublai led another army against the rebels in Manchuria. Kublai's commander Oz Timur's Mongol force attacked Nayan's 60,000 inexperienced soldiers on June 14, while ethnic Han and Alan guards under Li Ting protected Kublai. The army of Chungyul of Goryeo assisted Kublai in battle. After a hard fight, Nayan's troops withdrew behind their carts, and Li Ting began bombardment and attacked Nayan's camp that night. Kublai's force pursued Nayan, who was eventually captured and executed without bloodshed, by being smothered under felt carpets, a traditional way of executing princes. Meanwhile, the rebel prince Shikakushur invaded Liaoning but was defeated within a month. Kaidu withdrew westward to avoid a battle. However, Kaidu defeated a major Yuan army in the Kongai Mountains and briefly occupied Karakoram in 1289. Kaidu had ridden away before Kublai could mobilize a larger army. Widespread but incoordinated uprisings of Nayan's supporters continued until 1289, these were ruthlessly repressed. This rebellion forced Kublai to approve the creation of the Liaoyang branch secretariat on December 4, 1287, while rewarding loyal fraternal princes. Later years. Kublai Khan dispatched his grandson Gamala to Birkin Khaldun in 1291 to ensure his claim to Ik Korik, where Genghis was buried, a sacred place strongly protected by the Kublaids. Bayan was in control of Karakoram and was re-establishing control over surrounding areas in 1293, so Kublai's rival Kaidu did not attempt any large-scale military action for the next three years. From 1293 on, Kublai's army cleared Kaidu's forces from the central Siberian plateau. After his wife Chabi died in 1281, Kublai began to withdraw from direct contact with his advisors, and he issued instructions through one of his other queens, Nambui. Only two of Kublai's daughters are known by name, he may have had others. Unlike the formidable women of his grandfather's day, Kublai's wives and daughters were an almost invisible presence. Kublai's original choice of successor was his son Zhenzhen, who became the head of the Jiangshu Sheng and actively administered the dynasty according to Confucian fashion. An official proposed that Kublai should abdicate in favor of Zhenzhen in 1285, a suggestion that angered Kublai, who refused to see Zhenzhen. Zhenzhen died soon afterwards in 1286, eight years before his father. Kublai regretted this and remained very close to his wife, Barim, also known as Kokujin. Kublai became increasingly despondent after the deaths of his favorite wife and his chosen heir Zhenzhen. The failure of the military campaigns in Vietnam and Japan also haunted him. Kublai turned to food and drink for comfort, became grossly overweight, and suffered gout and diabetes. The emperor overindulged in alcohol and the traditional meat-rich Mongol diet, which may have contributed to his gout. Kublai sank into depression due to the loss of his family, his poor health and advancing age. Kublai tried every medical treatment available, from Korean shamans to Vietnamese doctors, and remedies and medicines, but to no avail. At the end of 1293, the emperor refused to participate in the traditional New Year's ceremony. Before his death, Kublai passed the seal of crown prince to Zhenzhen's son Timur, who would become the next Khagan of the Mongol Empire and the second ruler of the Yuan dynasty. Seeking an old companion to comfort him in his final illness, the palace staff could choose only Bayan, more than 30 years his junior. Kublai weakened steadily, and on February 18, 1294, he died at the age of 78. Two days later, the funeral cortege took his body to the burial place of the Khans in Mongolia. Family. Wives and children. Kublai first married Tegulin but she died very early. Then he married Chabi of the Conjurad, who was his most beloved empress. After Chabi's death in 1281, Kublai married Chabi's young cousin, Nambui, presumably in accordance with Chabi's wish. Principal wives, first and second Ordos. Tegulin Cotton, d. 1233, daughter of Tuolian of Conjurat. She married Kublai in 1232 but died shortly after giving birth. Dorji, b. circa 1233, d. 1263, the director of the secretariat and head of the Bureau of Military Affairs from 1261, but was sickly and died young. Empress Chabi, b. 1216, m. 1234, d. 1281, daughter of Chigu Noyan from Conjurad. She bore him four sons, six daughters. 
Empress Nambui, M. 1283 went missing 1290, daughter of Nakan, who was the uncle of Empress Chabi. Wives from Third Ordo. Empress Talahai, Empress Nuhan. Wives from Fourth Ordo. Empress Bayaujin, Empress Kokolin. Concubines. Lady Babahan, Lady Sabuhu, Korukachin Cotton, Dorbejin Cotton, Hushajin Cotton, Asujin Cotton. Poetry. Kublai was a prolific writer of Chinese poetry, although most of his works are now lost. Only one Chinese poem written by him is included in the selection of Yuan poetry, titled, Inspiration Recorded While Enjoying the Ascent to Spring Mountain. It was translated into Mongolian by the Inner Mongolian scholar B. Bayan in the same style as classical Mongolian poetry and transcribed into Cyrillic by Ya. Ganbatar. It is said that once in spring Kublai Khan went to worship at a Buddhist temple at the Summer Palace in western Kanbalik, Beijing, and on his way back ascended Longevity Hill, Tuman Nast Yule in Mongolian, where he was filled with inspiration and wrote this poem. 